Let's do it again. Hey guys, welcome to uh, this webinar, Cinematic Storytelling in CryEngine Part 3 with Joe Garth. I am your host and moderator, Julius Carter. Um, welcome to the webinar. Guys, uh, I know some of you haven't uh, seen all of them, but we will post in the next email links to the previous webinars so that you can get up to date. Um, but without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, Joe Garth. Hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, continuing uh, cinematic storytelling in CryEngine. Uh, this is part three. Um, just bring up that there. Uh, yep. Uh, this is part three. In this part, we're going to be focusing on script writing and previs. Uh, so this is basically a, a, a basic knowledge of screen of script writing, uh, which is pretty essential for sort of coming up with ideas and concepts. Uh, it's really useful when interpreting other people's work. Uh, and in this session, we'll sort of go over the core concepts of storytelling and sort of the components that go into creating a good story. Uh, so, what are the key components of a story? Uh, the first thing is uh, really, it's essential that you write a script. This is something that it seems very obvious. But a lot of the time I see uh, people going into cinematics and larger projects while never really coming up with sort of a basic plan at the very beginning, never writing a script, never uh, coming up with what the feeling and the mood and the atmosphere of those uh, uh, of the project should be. So this is something super essential. If you're going to go into any project, I encourage you write a script, even if it's very basic. Um, so what's the sort of key components of a good script? Uh, Usually, that's having a main character or protagonist, that's one. So this is somebody that's basically the, the focal point of the movie. And without one, the film could be very diluted and really kind of lose its core message. So protagonist is usually somebody that people can relate to. It's somebody that's sort of, uh, it can be the everyman. Uh, it doesn't have to be in all cases, but this is in, in most very successful movies and, and TV shows, You'll have a, a protagonist that's you know, someone like Martin McFly or Luke Skywalker, uh, or someone like John McClane, who's just the you know he's just the cop and he's just uh, doing his job until one day blah 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 blah, blah happens. Um, doesn't always have to be. You can have more complex characters like, uh, for instance, uh, Vickers Van der Merwe from District Nine, who is really like starts off as this kind of like nice guy who's doing his job following orders, but he's doing it without question, which is a little bit shady. You know, and, and he just generally starts to only see the plight of the aliens, you know, sort of halfway through the movie and so on. Um, so a protagonist can always make bad choices and do really terrible things at the beginning of the movie. Usually they don't carry on doing them right till the end. Um, the point is not really to like or to really hate a protagonist. The point is just to have someone to follow, someone that sort of leads you through the journey and through the story. Uh, and the, the, the characters, uh, that you can actually focus on that character. Um, so yeah, don't be afraid to have characters with lots of shades of grey, and usually it makes them more interesting. So the other key, key ingredient is to make sure that this character has an opinion. So you can't really have uh, characters that are completely um, lacking any kind of empathy in a situation. Uh, so, so what needs to what needs to happen is that your character has some kind of a, an issue that's happening in his life. So, for instance, Luke Skywalker, he's basically uh, doing the moisture evaporators, and he wants to leave the planet. Um, yeah, DiCaprio's character in uh, 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 which one is it? Can't remember the movie name. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's, uh, Wolf of Wall Street. Wolf of Wall Street. Yep. Yeah. So DiCaprio's character in Wolf of Wall Street, you know, he's not necessarily really a nice guy. He starts off the movie as completely, he's a total dick, but he's bringing the, he's bringing you through the story. He's a fun character. Um, yeah, Social Network's the same thing. He's completely, uh, you know, uh, he's pretty much a bad guy, but he's not really a bad guy. He's sort of, uh, he's a he's not really uh, somebody that you totally hate, but he's quite relatable, and he brings you through the story. Um, so yeah, giving characters opinions is super important and not worrying about whether they're good or evil. Um, Luke Skywalker has this opinion of like, he is basically living in this farm, he's got nothing going for him, there's nowhere in life to go. Like, all his friends have gone off to the Space Academy and they're going to fly around and they're going to uh, have lots of fun and, and live awesome, exciting lives. 
uh, and he's going to be stuck here with the moisture evaporators on this in the middle of nowhere. Um, another good example is uh, John Connor, Terminator 2. He's basically a criminal. He's just sort of like, you know, his mom is in prison. He's, he's robbing ATMs. His whole life is, is terrible. Uh, and his opinion is, of course, I want to get out of here. I want to, you know, he, when someone tells him something, he's like, I don't like that. I like this. Luke Skywalker is like, I don't want to be in this farm anymore. I want to go off into outer space. These characters have objectives. They have dreams. They have opinions. Uh, so they're not just sort of passive. Uh, and that's one of the weird things that be, I think a lot of time people start with writing scripts that they, they think that by making a character that's kind of passive, it's going to make them more likable. But actually, I think people usually detest characters that uh, don't have opinions. So more opinionated people end up being liked a lot more. Uh, something you see in real life as well. Uh, lots of politicians, well, even recently, of course. Yeah. People with <laughs> insane opinions, even though they're totally crazy sometimes. <laughs> People find them a lot nicer than people who are just sort of like on the fence, you know. Uh, yeah. And that's yeah, maybe that's a failing of modern culture, but well, they're more vocal. They're more vocal yeah. than the silent protagonist. So. But in storytelling, it's it's one of those things. If you're telling stories, if you're creating pieces of media, you'll like a character a lot more if they they've got something to say. That's um, true. So the other thing is to that's important is to give them something to do. Uh, and in that way, it's, the protagonist should basically impact the flow of the story. Uh, so the things that the character is doing and reacting to actually change the flow of the story and make an impact on that. Uh, so it seems pretty obvious, but it's, it's one of those things that can be missed sometimes, is that the story isn't just happening around the character. It's not just like he wakes up one day and it's World War Three, and he's just going to go and do his own thing and he never really gets to change it. It should be that, no, it's World War Three and there's a bomb and he has to stop this. Or there's World War Three and the, he's got to learn to fly the jet to save mankind. Something could, like this. It's never this like, oh, well, it's just happening around him and he's just kind of there. It could also be for him to get away from yeah. like the survive. radius. So the survive, survive the bomb. <coughs> that could also be a... But yeah. Um, <coughs> so that's usually... If they're repairing or sort of working on something, like uh, in Gravity, it's quite interesting because she's really, the central protagonist is really there to, to try to fix this space station and then it's just all hell breaks loose and then she has to survive. So the act of her doing all of these things to survive is what keeps the story moving and keeps mm -hmm. it going. Uh, so there's it's always that thing of like, okay, now I've got to get to this other space station, then I've got to get to this capsule, then I've got to put out this fire, and then I've got to, and that's bringing you on that journey with her. But surely that's got to get a little <coughs> stressful for the viewer at some point, right? But yeah. Is and there too many? It's kind of the interesting thing that uh, you need to have this downtime and uptime sort of thing. Okay. So there's like these these big events that happen that challenge you, and then you've got a bit of relax okay. so there's like some Resolve. level of balance in, in mm -hmm. how you're doing this um, but usually that's a cool thing in that you've got this like it, it, it should feel like a roller coaster ride it's right. like once you've solved one problem then there's some other problem that you need to solve yeah uh, so in the case of Star Wars you know there's that um, there's a great talk from JJ Abrams uh, called the mystery box it's on TED talks mm -hmm. that's really nice uh, where he describes how Star Wars works in terms of mechanics and that's really something that's like uh, there are these mystery boxes within the actual script that once you open that, you've got a mystery that's solved, and then there's the next mystery that's then a, a new question that's brought to you, and that needs to be solved as well. So right. it's kind of a similar thing. It's that uh, when you solve something, it creates a new problem, or you have something that the protagonist is doing that impacts the story, uh, and that's something that's super important to have. If you don't have this sort of impact and then uh, uh, basically... Uh, cause and effect, then things are really boring. Um, so yeah, give them something to do. So that's it. Gravity is a great example. Um, what's what's kind of interesting is uh, even, even sort of kids movies and uh, it doesn't really matter in particular what sort of movie that uh, that's there. It's, it's always got some sort of uh, a theme to it so actually monsters university is a good example and that you know it's ex almost it's a very similar to movie to the first one the only difference is that it's now they're going to university 
So it's just like this, you know, it's a brand, it's a branded theme, you know, it's just like, okay, well now we're going to make a sequel. It's like, well, we're going to bring, bring the same exact characters, the same exact kind of idea. And we're going to take that to some other world. Right. Um, so it's like, okay, I've got these characters, you know, Vikings and I've got made the first movie and it's Vikings one and then I'll make Vikings two and I'll, this will be the Vikings and the lava planet. Right. And that's course. the whole thing. Like, you know, it's like <laughs> now they go to a lava planet and that's the, that's the story. So of course you have to have something there. Um, that does that, or you know, they're going off, they're fighting something that's basically Star Wars. Um, that's the the hero's journey, which is the uh, is pretty much based on the uh, hero of the Thousand Faces, Joseph Campbell, which is very famous script writing, uh, sort of uh, basically the the bare bones structure of script writing for hero stories. So uh, look into that as well. It's pretty useful. Um, so the other thing is that maybe they impact the story just by being who they are. So really this is something is like if they are a person that is just different in some way, there's something about them that is different and that's what makes the story happen. So it's really the that's that's a direct correlation between the hero of the protagonist and the actual story structure. So Forrest Gump is a great example of that where he is really just things are happening because he's Forrest Gump. He goes to Vietnam and he's Forrest Gump and that's why he's a hero in Vietnam. Right. You know, he goes to uh yeah, he, he goes playing football and he's really awesome at football because he's Forrest Gump and he just runs. And yep. that's it. Like that's true. otherwise, so, you know, if you if you would have Forrest Gump w with anybody else other than Forrest Gump, it would be a very boring movie. It'd be a weird movie, I think. <laughs> yeah. If it was Forrest Gump but with just me, like I think it wouldn't I, I think it wouldn't it wouldn't really make I just, sense actually. Yeah, I would just be there playing Pong really badly <laughs> and not terrible. winning any medals. I wouldn't watch yeah, it. I wouldn't watch it. You wouldn't watch it, right? So yeah, you've got to have a, a protagonist, you've got to have a protagonist that is affecting the flow of the plot. Um the other thing that's, uh, it's just like giving a core understanding of what the character does. So the interesting thing is that Forrest Gump actually has these character uh, character traits, you know, and that's stuff like, okay, he's not he's not a fast talker, he's not able to do that stuff. He has, you know, they say at the beginning of the movie, he has a low IQ, but there are things that he's very, very good at, which is running very, very quickly, being brave without question. Uh, what else does he do? He does some awesome stuff. Playing really good ping pong. You know, he's got all of these things. Uh, making crazy investments in uh, fruit companies when he has no idea about the fruit company and yeah. what it actually does. And it turns out to be a technology company that becomes Apple. Yeah. You know, he just does these things, but he has no idea why he does them. But he does those things because he has these traits of innocence and uh, that sort of... Level it's, of naivety. It's, like it's genius naive. without being genius. He's also very naive when he yeah. goes about... Super naive. And, and, and that's... But it's his character that creates the, the movie. So right. that's really a good, a good way to look at it. So... The other, the other thing you could do is, of course, like uh, basically have uh, character growth or even perhaps lack of character growth. So the interesting thing is that a lot of... Well, the misconception is that you need to have... To have a good movie, you need to have some sort of character growth. This isn't necessary, actually. In a lot of examples, uh, there are a lot of examples of really great movies where the character doesn't change from start to finish and the protagonist doesn't change and things stay exactly the same and still a great film. Um, so, of course, there's, uh, there are movies where the characters do change. For instance, uh, Schindler's List, where Oscar Schindler is basically changing from the start to the finish. He's coming up with this decision to make this, re you know, this, uh, this crazy decision of, oh God, I'm going to actually be the hero and I'm going to save these people. But he's making that decision throughout the movie. He starts off as pretty much a conventional businessman and ends up being uh, the savior of these people's lives. Um, or, uh, for instance, the, uh, the journey of uh, Vincent in Gattaca, where he's sort of willing to do anything to go to space. He starts off as this you know, humble beginnings guy who just wants to do whatever it takes to, uh, to become an astronaut. So he basically uh, wants to prove that he's capable of... of uh, beating his genetically enhanced counterparts and this is something that's just like this drive he's never going to stop he just wants to do this thing and he, his character has to change because of this dream um, uh, there are also other characters that just do don't change uh, from start to finish uh, so in the movie contact um, Arroway's character starts off as an atheist who wants to explore the stars and meet alien life but she ends the movie in the exact same mindset um, 
So the sort of powerful idea here is that the protagonist is, is proved right. Um, so she never finds religion, even though everybody is telling her that, uh, you know, there is a God, there must be a God, there must be this thing. But her scientific experience becomes for her a religious experience. And that's something that's, uh, that she, she already, already felt from the beginning and it's now a reality. Um, and not to ruin the ending, but yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, sometimes it's just about the characters sticking to their guns and just being proved right in the end. Um, so yeah, don't get so caught up with character growth because you can still make a character, a powerful story about a character that changes and grows, uh, but you can make an equally powerful story about one that uh, makes the, uh, that stays the same uh, and sort of stands their ground. <coughs> so yeah, sometimes I to get to my quick my slides. So, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the impact character. <coughs> so a bit of cough today. Uh, the impact character is uh, a character that changes the main character's story arc in some way. So, the pretty common example of this is somebody like sort of Gandalf or Obi Wan Kenobi, who are really like a. Uh, they they change the the motivation of the protagonist by coming into their world. Uh, so Luke seeking out Obi Wan Kenobi and asking him for you know for his advice, figure out who he is, how he knows his father. This is something that. It, it triggers the next part of the plot. Uh, without an impact character, there's no way that Star Wars could happen. You know, it just it, you need to have something, somebody that drives the story forward. Um, so, and this is usually a character that has sort of a different uh, motive uh, or sort of different worldview to the uh, protagonist. So, it's really, it's really somebody that's, uh, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be like the, you know, the wise old sage like Obi Wan Kenobi or Gandalf, but could be somebody like Tyler Durden from Fight Club, who is just kind of a wild card. You're not really sure what what he's doing. Does he want to come into, uh, you know, he he's starting this Fight Club, or is that like actually his his thing, or is he just like this uh, friendly guy? You know, you see him stealing a car. It's like, what's going on here? Um, he's disrupting the character's uh, life. Uh, with a completely different worldview, uh, the narrator in the in Fight Club is just living his life normally. He's living out routine. Tyler Durden is the opposite of that. Um, the other thing the impact character can be is, of course, uh, an antagonist. Uh, so, for instance, somebody that's completely just you know mer uh, maniacally evil. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, Hans Gruber, perfect example from Die Hard, just wants to rob the bank. That's it. You think that he's some kind of an eco-terrorist or some sort of like awesome group of terrorists that are doing some kind of uh, anti-corporate thing at the beginning, and then you realize, no, nah, they're just, just bank. bank robbers. They're just robbers. They're <laughs> just, just evil scumbags. Good and old-fashioned bank robbers. Just old-fashioned. It's all about money for, for him. Uh, but yeah, so the, he, he's also an impact character in that, of course, Die Hard would never happen if Hans Gruber wouldn't show up with his <laughs> group of, of robbers. Uh, the other important thing, of course, third major ingredient is the predicament. Uh, so in addition to having main character, uh, impact character, you, you have to have a, a predicament for these two characters. So... It can be that they're on different sides of this predicament. It could be there's some sort of war or there's some sort of conflict. And in the case of Die Hard, you've got the uh, John McClane on the side of the police and then you've got the uh, robbers coming to rob the thing and there are two different sides of a predicament. The predicament is Hans Gruber wants the money. That's the predicament. <laughs> uh, so this is usually something like aliens uh, basically want to take over the world or destroy the planet or the uh, president's plane is attacked by... Uh, terrorists, or it could be something completely, uh, completely different. Like you're basically uh, the uh, love story girl that you love is flying off to Alaska and she's going to join Greenpeace, something like that. Um, or it could be something more like Reservoir Dogs, which is that something has happened, and then there's going to be the fallout from that thing happening. So that's usually the situation where it's like, okay, how is this going to get resolved? So they rob the bank at the beginning. How is all of these different story? How do all of these story threads un unwind? And how do we solve this sort of mystery that's that's come about from that? Um, so yeah. So in general, 
there are these three things to consider. Uh, main character, impact character, and a predicament. And once you have those three things, you're already in pretty good shape. The other thing that can help is having a simple store, uh, sort of formula for telling a story. Uh, and this is one that um, was used quite a lot um, in Pixar. It was actually leaked out from a bunch of documents about storytelling in Pixar. I think there's, if you Google this, 22 tips of storytelling from Pixar. Uh, very handy tips. They're really cool. Uh, I think that it's uh, really a good approach, and it will help you sort of not make so many of those sort of basic errors when when putting together a script. Um, one of the coolest parts of this is this really nice formula for coming up with a simple story. And you can literally just take this formula and come up with a simple story in about five minutes. So this is the, uh, the Pixar method formula for storytelling. And it just goes, once upon a time there was uh, something. Every day, he something, something, something. One day, something happened. Because of that, something else happened. Because of that, something else happened until finally over. So the idea is that using that formula, you can quickly fill that in and you can come up with a basic story or an outline for that story. The interesting thing is it doesn't necessarily have to be huge amounts of text that you fill in these gaps with. So you can come up with a fairly basic story. Uh, of course, you know, your subject matter is if it's interesting, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come up with a lot better story. Um, but because there are these turns, because there are these, uh, it forces, because of the wording of this, this formula, it actually forces you to create a different path and then, oh, and then this happens and then this happens. And if you don't follow this formula, you could just come up with something that's just kind of winding and meandering somewhere and it's not really coming up with some, um, it's not really doing something sort of uh, super interesting, twists and turns, that kind of thing. Um, so I filled in an example story. This is the moment, Julius, <laughs> where you get to see my crazy story telling. I'm looking forward to it. <coughs> I have a so, it's going to be awesome. I don't know about that. Um, so, yeah, this is pretty much uh, taking the story formula method and filling it out. So once there lived a one-eyed Viking named Stephen. He lived a happy life in the village of Hagenstrudestead. That's a real place, by the way. Hagenstrudestead? Hagenstrudestead. Uh, Hagenstrud. His best friends were all warriors from the last war, the, the last great war. There was Billy the Armless, Bob the Legless, and Thornton the Dumb. Don't know if you could tell what I'm doing here. No, it's, oh. Every day, every day, Think about the formula every day. That's part, that's the first one. So we've had once upon a time, you've had the setup, and now we go every day. So every day, Stephen, the one-eyed Viking, went out to the woods to hunt. Those are the woods. Those are the woods. Yeah. <laughs> Just as he did and his father before him, they went out to hunt the deer. One day, one day, this is the next part of the formula, I should have this coming up on the screen somewhere or something like that. Uh, one day, he's hunting a deer, and in a freak accident, the arrow bounces off a tree and plants itself in his knee. So he's in huge amounts of pain and limping through the forest. Ow, my knee! That's him, by the way. That, that's my voice impression of him. Uh, because of that, this is the first because of that, because something has happened the one day because of that so we're forced to change now what's what's happened uh, he discovers an old house that's a creepy old house um, is it yeah it's a creepy old house in the middle of the woods I wouldn't go there I definitely didn't pull this off Google images <laughs> um, <laughs> seeking help he knocks on the door and an old woman answers she's very old and wearing strange clothes Stephen asks her are you a witch? And she tells him, a witch? That's ridiculous. I'm not a witch. He glimpses through a nearby doorway and a very strange sight. Dozens of tiny cots, but no babies or children at all. The old woman slams the door and quickly covers what looks like a cauldron with a, th a thick blanket. 
The old woman gives Stephen a warm soup, which has a strange taste. And he could have sworn that it was glowing a little bit green. Okay, mine in the image is, is glowing very green, but maybe it was only a little bit glow, glowing green. Um, because of that, he falls into a deep sleep. And when he wakes up, he seems miraculously cured of all of his injuries. Not a scratch on him. The arrow is... is it, wound is not there anymore, and he feels great, like a million bucks. Stranger yet, he has both eyes. Stephen, the one-eyed Viking, now has two eyes. This is crazy. Where did that come from? Where did that happen? How did that happen? So he I drinks this stuff, and it, it gave him his eye ba eyes back. He also feels younger. No, wait. He was younger. He is younger. It's as if the last decade had never happened. All his wrinkles are going. It's looking great. He's like, wow, awesome. So, because of that, he runs back to the village. And he goes, I was blind, but now I can see. You can see this is quite an old story. In it's a, a great story. Yeah, I was blind, but now I can see. Uh, he goes back to the village and he tells everyone the good news. Everyone, everyone, it's it's a miracle. Uh, there's this old woman. She gave me this amazing potion and it healed me completely. I can see again. And all the people got really excited. All the townsfolk whip into this frenzy. If she can heal one person, maybe she can heal the rest. So Bob No Leg is shouting, I could get my leg back. And then everyone with a cough or a cold or a sprained ankle or no arms... Billy No Arm, Bill, Bob No Leg, or Thornton the Dumb. This Thorn names. Thornton the Dumb thinks that he can he can get he get smart again by drinking the, the potion. I hope it works for, but, for him. I don't know I if it, it can out. cure stupidity, but I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's Limitless. worth a shot. It's right. So they all march, limp, and roll their way into the forest, and they arrive at the old woman's house and bang on the door. Help us, help us, healers of our woes, they cry. And the old woman opens the door. This is the until finally the old woman opens the door. I have to make sure I keep saying the parts of the formula so mm. this works. Until finally the old woman opens the door. She immediately insists she is not a witch. She is <laughs> not a witch. I'm not a witch. She lets everyone in and they all run for the cauldron. Drinking handfuls and fistfuls and massive gulps of this uh, potion. After the frenzy, everyone starts to feel very, very tired. So tired that they all fall into a deep, deep sleep. And several hours pass. The old woman picks up a sleeping baby. This is the other until finally. You can have more than one. So several hours have passed they're all asleep screen fades to black everything over until finally the old woman picks up a small sleeping baby and she says to the child my dear child I have something to tell you I am a witch and then she does an evil crackle <laughs> and she places the little baby into a wooden cot where did this baby come from why is there a wooden cot What's going on? And then she walks past out of the room and we see, the camera's pulling backward, we see all these little babies in all these little cots. And as she's about to close the door, the sound of the door closing wakes up the baby and you just hear these babies crying. This is dark. Man. Another and another and we see that all these little babies are in there. And the moral of the story is, be careful what you wish for. Ooh. So yeah, that's the twist. They all got turned into little babies because they drank too much of the potion. Oh, okay. It's pretty grim, isn't you it? You know what would have been a cool twist? Is yeah. if, the, if, there's, if, if she was harvesting the babies and then like putting those parts on the Vikings while they were sleeping. Hmm. That's pretty twisted. That's, that's pretty grim. That's even more twisted than them getting turned into babies. Well, that's what it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I th I think it's it's one of those weird things where it's like if you if you drink too much of this thing, it makes you so young. Have you ever seen that episode of Star just... Trek where it's like you you drink too much of something good and then you become like aging in reverse, like it just makes you like even younger until you're like Benjamin Button until you're gone, until you're nothing. So, That'd yeah. be horrible. Horrible. 
Good so yeah, that's the, that's the Stephen the One-Eyed Viking story. Uh, that was written about Bravo. 20 minutes. Um, it could be a, uh, a, a short film, maybe. Or I'd a, watch that. That was entertaining. Or a movie. I, I really found that entertaining. I mean, yeah. the naming conventions were... We're a bit strange. Uh, Billy Bob, Th- <laughs> Billy, Billy Bob, Bob Thornton. You know, Bob No Leg. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, you can tell Bob. I spent a long time on it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, the, the interesting thing about the formula is that you can come up with stories very fast. It doesn't necessarily create uh, Shakespeare, but it does mean that your stories will at least have some sort of entertainment value. It will allow you to get the twists in there. It will keep it focused on what's important, which is moving story along, giving you something else to say, instead of it being something... Uh, sort of pie in the sky and doesn't really appeal to anybody. It's a very good example. Um, so this also does have its limits. Of course, your subject matter and your core concept has to be slightly interesting, which is why I do mind about Vikings and witches and potions, because these are all sort of classic ideas and I think people all understand. Uh, it's not really something that you know people are like, what is that? I don't get it. I don't have to explain like a whole backstory. People get what pirates are and ninjas and Vikings and so on. So these are archetypes. Uh, so if you want to get an, an idea across quickly, in for instance a short film, better to stick to archetypes rather than try to sort of reinvent the wheel uh, and do things completely from scratch differently. Um, the other thing is, of course, try not to, of course, have really boring characters. Uh, of course, you can make movies like Margin Call, you know, about bankers and uh, you know chartered accountants and stuff. That's really great if you've got a movie script as good as Margin Call that's about that particular topic. But if your movie is about a banker and it's not got a really riveting uh, you know story to tell about bankers, it could end up being really boring. Uh, the other thing is that just some some subject matters are super boring, uh, so probably better to just stay away from those unless you have some amazing thing about the 2008 financial crisis or something like that. You know. <laughs> well, every, every field has its awesome stories, but uh, unless you have some awesome subject matter, it's, it could get a bit boring. Um, unless they all start killing each other, in which case things aren't boring. Then you have movie mm-hmm. pay, Paycheck with Ben Affleck. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Which, That's right. Yeah, it's the John Woo movie. Uh-huh. He's a banker or something, and then he just starts killing people. He's, he's very murdery. I can't remember why. Um, <laughs> it's very murdery in that. So, yeah, the, the other interesting thing is, uh, yeah, that's the moral of that story. Be careful what you wish for, uh, which we'll go on to later, because moral is really important. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is the uh, three-act structure. And you hear a lot about the three-act structure. But I would say, in reality, it's not as important as uh, perhaps you've heard. I think that the three-act structure can be a nice thing to, to, to think about, but generally, if you're worried about sticking to it and you stick too rigidly to it, it could you know, basically ruin what you were trying to achieve in the first place. So don't let the three-act structure get in the way of the important things, which is protagonist, impact character, uh, having a pr- predicament, uh, and having some sort of a formula going on there. You can deviate from this stuff, of course, but this is how you can get good ideas quickly. Um, so yeah, it helps you sort of uh, can be can be a good sort of the three act structure can be a good sort of starting point to allow you to develop the idea and sort of come up with the the dots connect all the dots. But you still need to come up with a good twist and sort of moralistic method. Uh, sorry, moralistic method, uh, message yourself. And that's something that depends on the subject matter and what you want to convey. Um, so. Uh, the interesting thing that uh, that uh, another another thing that definitely you need to come up with is actually a moral of the story, uh, and this is something that's so, uh, is super important. If you don't have a moral in the end, or some sort of uh, something to take away uh, at the very end that someone can basically uh, focus on, it could be a very boring story. So, for instance, uh, this has to be something like. Uh, uh, rise or fall from power or uh, it needs to be something like a one-line message that uh, you can really understand Um, so a movie movies that have quite interesting uh, ideas or core ideas like uh, they have basically a premise Um, so this is stuff like the Truman Show like the premise is like uh, the premise of the Truman Show is he's living in a reality TV show or liar liar which is uh, he's got to lie all the time. There's a one line, like, they're not really morals, but they're more like premises. They're like, 
one sentence that sums up what it's about. Uh, so these, these are really uh, simple things. Uh, if you don't have something that's just one sentence that sums it all up, like be careful what you wish for, things can get very difficult. Um, Bruce Almighty, Jim Carrey is God. That's the premise. Super easy, super simple. Everybody gets the idea, concept <clears throat> of the movie very quickly. If you have a trailer for this movie, uh, it's very easy to do. Um, the other thing you can do is, of course, just take two existing premise uh, or ideas, uh, Jaws and a Twister, and just put them together. And then you've got a new premise, Sharknado, which is one of the most successful, terrible movies of all time. Yeah, Sharknado does um, well. So yeah, you can basically see where this is going. At some point, you're just merging sort of re, uh, you know, recent releases or movies in the last 20, 10, 20 years, and then you're becoming with this kind of like, it's getting a bit boring then, because it's just superhero movies and reboots and rehashes of sort of familiar concepts and ideas. So what is usually a better way of coming up with a premise is to take, uh, yeah, so superhero movies are a dime a dozen, they're all like that. A better way to do this uh, is to go in the sort of James Cameron, Ridley Scott sort of vein of thinking, which is uh, instead of taking something that's recent as a concept, take something that's super timeless. Uh, so that's something that's like an old novel or a fairy tale that has never really been done in the modern era. Uh, or if it has, it's been done in a completely different way. So Avatar is a perfect example of this. It's really taking Pocahontas, taking the whole idea of Pocahontas and bringing it into the far future with aliens and science fiction and it's awesome. It's a great film uh, because it takes this core idea. Um, so Pocahontas in space is the premise. It's great. Pocahontas it's awesome. Pocahontas in space. It's, it's, it's incredible. Like You could just do this with everything. <laughs> you could just do this with everything. I can I yeah. So uh so simply recreating a moral uh sorry, recreating a novel that's so famous or popular that it doesn't even need repackaging. This is something that movie studios are doing all the time. That's why we see, of course, uh oh Shrek is an example of of course taking a timeless fairy tale and bringing it into a CG film. Um our own game, plug for Crytek, huh. Robinson the Journey, this is another example of this. Robinson Crusoe, taking Robinson Crusoe and bringing that into uh, a new video game in virtual reality. In space. Uh, and it's Robinson Crusoe in space, yeah. which is very similar to Avatar, which is yeah. Pocahontas in space. Just all great ideas. Um, Lord of the Rings, of course, taking a novel uh, or old fairy tale, bringing it into the modern era. That's interesting because it's something that's so uh, sort of it's so some, it's something that's so well recognized. It doesn't especially need any sort of rebranding or repackaging. Uh, so this is stuff like Lord of the Rings, Tarzan, King Kong, uh, those kind of movies where it's just like, well, everybody knows what King Kong is. Everybody knows what Tarzan is. Everybody knows, you know, if they would make a new Pocahontas movie now, it'd be like, oh, Pocahontas. Okay, cool. You know, <laughs> it, it's it's really easy to redo that stuff. Um, and the interesting thing is that the actual. Uh, license to use that stuff is is actually becoming uh, more and more popular or, or sorry more and more uh legally it, it's legally possible now because it's all public domain so that's that's interesting that it's i think it's something before 1920 or 1930 there is a certain cutoff date uh and this is one of the problems that disney is having right now because they have to you know stuff like mickey mouse is getting older than that now Huh. I didn't so, know that that was uh, there was a time limit on this. On yeah, this they side. have to renew all of their trademarks and all of their licenses now for all of that stuff because That's it's almost over a hundred years old. It's actually kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, because that, that leaves a lot open to the creatives out mm. there who aren't doing. So, so yeah, if you find an old book from <clears throat> 120 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, the chances are that you can use all that. I think Conan the Barbarian uh, and that kind of stuff is all public domain now so really yeah that, that there's like huge huge amounts of stuff that's public domain because it's simply been left to fall into the public domain it's not been huh. renewed um so interesting yeah um is there a place where you can go and see <laughs> that, like that kind of information i like think on i think on wikipedia there's a list of quite a lot of this stuff that's public domain that okay. you can find but of course you have to check each one and with All the right. Conan thing, I think the interesting thing is that there's an, there's a section of Conan that, of course, is not. So, for instance, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, yeah, you cannot, I mean, you cannot use that. 
uh, but the actual story itself in the book, you can create. It's just open. Yeah, it's open. Cool. So, so there's like the MMO of Conan. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, stuff like that. And it has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, so yeah. Just but it kind of, it kind of. I mean, the marketing kind of made it look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He looks a bit like Arnie. But I don't think it's the same thing. I'm, maybe I'm wrong there. I'm not really a huge Conan fan, so I'm not, not too sure. But there are examples of that where you've got like, yeah, basically a license that's come out of uh, style and uh, or it's it's over that hundred year mark or something. Okay. Or I think it's even seventy five years. I think it's not even a hundred. Uh, so that's why Disney already have problems. Uh, the other thing, of course, is you can just take this and just could throw it all out the window. And don't go with conventional thinking, which is copying stuff from other people's uh, concepts. And do something really, really crazy. But the chances are, if you're a beginner, uh, it's usually better to start off with existing ideas that people understand rather than going with something completely new. The Pixar movie Inside Out, this is an example of basically throwing away everything else, throwing away convention, and starting with something that's a core... Uh, it's basically based on core human emotions. So this is possible if you've got perfect cinematography, perfect design, uh, you can build universe from the ground up. If you're Pixar, you can do this. Uh, but even Pixar, it took them so long to get to this point where they're creating really original uh, IPs to this, you know, in this crazy way. So uh, you know, stuff like Finding Nemo and Inside Out and these kind of things, which are very like uh, Wally, you know, where it's taking these, uh, trying to create completely new ideas. That's more difficult to do. Um, and of course, it's yeah, Inside Out is, is the uh, craziest. It's, so it's not an existing crazy. idea, so it's uh, it's maybe a bit where trickier to pull off if you're not Pixar. So if you're a beginner, I would go with something simpler. Um, which gets us on to uh, the last part now of the, the webinar, which is about previous. Um, so once you have written your script and you have a basic understanding of what you want to do with your story, uh, you've got your uh, formula in there, you've got your uh, protagonist, you've got your impact character, you've got your predicament, uh, you've got a moral a message uh, to the story uh, premise. Once you have that, then you can go into actually blocking out your film. Now the mistake that usually happens is that people go into the block out stage before they have all of the rest of it. That's not a good thing to do. The best way is to, of course, uh, get everything already blocked out uh, it, sorry, get everything already, uh, uh, get your, your entire premise already organized and your script written and all of that stuff, and then you go into the previous stage. Uh, and previs, of course, is when you uh, create a block out or a block a matic of your cinematic. So that's basically, instead of using real characters with everything finished and final, you're using basically blo uh, boxy renders uh, with blocks everywhere. So I have an example now from... Bring this up. Oh, I have to go to the question. I can cut this part out if you want. Oh, we don't have access to it. Oh, I thought we had access now. To your personal drive. Uh, okay, never mind. I was going to show a movie from. Uh, we can already cut it. We can cut it in, right? Movies. Uh, no, it's not going to be collided. I'm just going to cut out the part that was missing. And now this part. I could just send you the movie and. Okay, just go. Probably works. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of actual methods of blocking out shots. Um, I mentioned some of them uh, last uh, in the last webinar, part two, um, which were basically focusing more on composition and lighting. Um, one of the most important, of course, is the, the axis or the half circle rule. This is something that's really intrinsic to uh, cinematics and you have to look at this from the very beginning, right from an early block out stage uh, to help you choose the cinematic shots that you will use and in order to tell the story in a way that's uh, not confusing the viewer. Um, so a lot of this I will put uh, in the handouts uh, that we'll give away with the course. Um, the other thing that's really helpful is capturing reference. Um, so this is something that's like for instance, with the uh, so you can just take your mobile phone, you could take your uh, your camera, and you can capture yourself acting out uh, the cinematic. And this can be done even if you are 
Yeah, they're doing is animatic, animatic about squirrels or teddy bears or aliens. It doesn't matter what it is. This is something that's uh, yeah, lose the uh, basically lose the sort of uh, uh, embarrassment and just be a squirrel and see what happens. Uh, so if you look at lots of the uh, so demo reels of animators from uh, DreamWorks, Pixar, uh, Blue Sky, those guys are basically like if they're animating a squirrel. Or doing a the broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Doing it, you know, they're doing all kinds of stuff, like pretending to get the nuts or do whatever they're doing. Um, so, really, just a case of, of going the extra mile, taking reference, and doing that stuff. Uh, and then the next step, once you have the reference, is go to T-Post Blockout. Now, T-Post Blockout. Uh, my example here doesn't exactly use T-poses, uh, but what it has is very, very basic animations. So let's see if I can dock the uh, track view here on the side. So we went over a bit last time uh, how the track view tool works. Um, let's see if I can fit all the stuff on my one screen here. sequence. So this is the track view editor in CryEngine. You can access this by just going to uh, tools uh, and then down to track view and that will open this window here. I usually just dock this on the side uh, and at the top you'll see this little file menu. You can click file open and that will open the sequences panel and there you can see all the sequences you have listed. If you don't have a, a sequence yet you can click uh, here and go uh, to new and that will create you a new sequence which is just a blank template. Uh, but I'm just going to open mine already uh, that I've already created which is my master sequence. So I actually have f uh, seven shots here in the list. Um, so each shot, if I actually navigate to that one, just select like my camera, if I scrub through you can see the, uh, the cinematic taking place. Um, and this is a very simple uh, track view sequence. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I literally just have my squirrel uh, mesh, which is uh, an animate uh, is an anim object with the squirrel CDF attached, uh, sorry, uh, specified in there. This is something that we actually ship with the CryEngine SDK, the, Cry uh, the game SDK, which you can download on the marketplace. Uh, so here I've just placed an anim object with the squirrel as a CDF, and then I've just added that to track view. And you can just add objects to track view by clicking, um, if we go on here, oh, my panels are a bit small here, so I make them bigger. Uh, you can just click add selected entity, so just choose your entity here in the uh, editor window and click add selected. That will bring your, uh, your node into track view here. So you can see my squirrel mail, and I have position, rotation, uh, this event track, which I don't actually need. Uh, I can just delete that actually and an animation track. So the animation track is where I just specify the uh, I specify basically this running loop uh, and then this idle animation here. And all I do is just loop this uh, this animation of the run uh, by ticking loop here. And then I have another idle animation here that it actually blends automatically into. So the cool thing about track view is that actually it, it will blend these two things together. So if I delete that, for instance, you can see it's no, no longer working. He's not going into the idle. I get that back now. Um, oops, just dragging stuff all over the place. If I get that back now, hopefully I can just go realize groups. Oh, <laughs> maybe I forgot outside the sequence again. Yeah, so now he's now he's uh, blending into that animation again. Uh, so that's a very simple setup. I just have these uh, animations that you can you can select here off the animation list uh, just by hitting that little folder there. And you can see the, the squirrel comes with three animations, a walk, a run, and an idle. And the idle is quite useful because he's just looking around, um, which is quite nice because he's got this little head movement that I kind of took advantage of for this uh, small cinematic. So I'll just show you the whole thing uh, playing back. I just hit play on my master sequence. So the master sequence is actually a sequence that allows you to play back multiple um, multiple sequences in order, uh, which really like a, a simple cutting tool. 
uh, so you can hear it, so you get, I've actually edited the, the cinematic together in, in CryEngine. Uh, it's all just running out of the box in real time. It's no, no, pre, no pre-rendering at all. I even have actually fades, uh, fades and dips to black, which you can also do in the uh, in the track view editor. So yeah, just telling a little story about this squirrel who tries to meet this lady squirrel, and uh, she's not very interested in him, <laughs> and runs away. But he built a raft. <laughs> he built a, a raft as a squirrel. And, and the, moral, the moral of this story is that you can try your best, but sometimes you don't succeed. But at least you still end up in the end yeah. with a nifty raft. I don't know if you also noticed, there's a bit more to the story, uh, which is that he actually sees up on this tree this, this nut here, which, uh, oh, it has not actually loaded. That's strange. Uh, yeah, we actually I actually have a nut model, which should be up here on the tree. You see where I'm wiggling that around. So he actually tries to get this nut at the top of the tree. Um, and he's like trying to basically use his brute strength to try to get up to the top of the tree and then fails because the nut is too high and he's just a squirrel and he can't do it. Uh, and then he tries to get the girl, which is the second objective, and then he tries to use his speed, like he tries to run really fast to jump across the river, but then he fails, so strength fails, speed fails, and then he uses his brain. Brains. He uses his brain to do it. And then he succeeds Kinda. at getting across the river. Well, he gets across the river. That's but, true. That's but true. then, uh, but then, she's just still not impressed. So even if you're, she's seen it all. Exactly. She's seen it all. So it doesn't matter if you're super smart. It doesn't matter. You can't do this. <laughs> maybe if he'd just been able to jump across, she would have been okay. That would have been impressive. Yeah. Surely. Then, then maybe she would have liked him. But I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so I, I made this story when I was uh, coming out of a bad breakup and I was angry or something, so... Wow, that got dark so, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, but no, it's, it's just a very nice story about two squirrels, that's all. There's no kind of subtext there. Um, and yeah, so you can see here in the master sequence I have the color correction node, which is very useful, and I just animate the brightness here to have these sort of dips to black, uh, which gives you this kind of nice dramatic... Like, oh, he's thinking about these sticks. And then, oh, he's built the ship. So cool. usually you usually do like fades to show the passage of time. Uh, so you you know you do some cross fade or like some, some sort of uh, dip to black and then come out of black and it shows that some time has passed between the two. Um, so let's find a shot where I can just show how this is put together. Uh, maybe I'll try and find one of the simpler shots to begin with. Uh, yeah, just to do the intro shot, actually. That's probably the simplest. Um, so each of these is built uh, in a separate sequence. Um, and pretty much all I'm doing is just animating very basically the uh, position of the uh, the squirrel, which uh, the actual squirrel anim object. You can see here that the CryEngine actually creates uh, keyframes, actually shows you, it pre previews your keyframes and how the speed of those keyframes is. Uh, so you can actually see in a spline here uh, of, of his movement. So in this, I'm very simple, just like he's running forward. But what I can do is actually go here and then just tick. Uh, it's going to get more space here. Just try to do all this on one screen so it's a bit small. Um, and then you hit this record button here, uh, which will let you basically keep. Uh, let's try and make this a bit bigger. There we go. Now I suppose. So if you hit this record button, you can then select the uh, any of the nodes in there. And once you move those around, uh, you can see that it's actually manipulating this spline here. Mm. So that that spline is what uh, allows you to uh, basically see how the how how the thing will animate. Uh, so now he's of course moving crazily to the side. And I'll delete that keyframe now. And yeah, my, my thing was just like, for, for Tipo's block, block out, I don't care about the animation quality. I, you know, so Keyframe Animator will come along later and do all that. So all I'm really caring about in Tipo's block out is uh, ju just the timing and the positions of the uh, characters on the screen. So I call it Tipo's block out. In this, I actually have a couple of animations, but I could also achieve this exact same uh, block out result without any animations at all. It would just look a bit worse. 
Um, what's cool is when you have actually got a couple of uh, neat little animations that you can blend in and out of, then you can you can come up with something a bit more uh, that tells the story a little bit better. Um, uh, the other thing I'm doing, of course, is animating the camera. In this shot, I really don't have very much camera movement, so you can see the camera just stays static there. It's really just moving forward a tiny bit, uh, just to give a bit of a focus to the shot. Um, so that's really just like moving from one frame to another. Uh, so this is a very, very simple shot. There's only like one or two keyframes on the squirrel, and then another couple of keyframes on the camera. Um, so if I go to the next shot, just kind of diagnose each one. Uh, this one's also quite simple. He's just stood there, and all he does is rotate his head around. So all I did is keyframe where the camera is, uh, which is the sa which uses the same uh, method as well. Like <coughs> you can just go into the camera. If you go here, click on camera, go to camera entity, uh, and I I just have camera one, uh, and then I just click record. And then if I move uh, the camera around, you actually have to go onto the camera uh, settings and untick lock camera movement. It's a bit tricky for newcomers because it's one of those things that you don't really know about unless you use the engine a bit. Uh, but there's this lock camera movement function that we always need to untick. So just untick that if you want to move the camera around. And you can see that as I move the camera, the keyframe there will actually uh, update. Uh, and if I move position, you'll see it's now created a new position key. And if I move that now off to the side a bit, we can now go back and forth between those camera positions, and that's really the essential part of like uh, that's really the essentials for for blocking out stuff uh, for moving cameras and animating cameras. Of course, the rest is up to you. You can go more complexity. Uh, you can go with more complexity, and you can of course start editing the actual curves. Um, for the most part, during block out, I don't really need to do that so much. I usually just like take all of the keyframes, select them all, and then I just hit auto tangents which will give you a basic um, smooth tangents from one keyframe to another for block out that's more than enough usually uh, I usually don't spend a lot of time there of course if you spend more time director might come along and say actually I want to have uh, this shot over here this side instead and then of course if you spent a long time animating this shot and you've made it look really really good all your work is wasted so the whole point of block out is just to keep it rough, keep it really simple, keep it so it's really malleable and changeable, and not something that's uh, you know got lots and lots of keyframes and super tons of complexity. Because when it comes to that, you'll need to redo it if somebody wants to change. So of course, less is more. Having less keyframes at this point is better, because it actually helps you to uh, uh, quickly change things if if need be. So yeah, altering cameras very fast that kind of stuff. Um, also lighting wise I really don't care too much at this point like I've got a couple of little lights that are just kind of lighting the whole scene a bit with some uh, projection lights and stuff like that but they're just kind of there to, to get the overall atmosphere a bit the you know how basically to, to make it feel a bit more like it's a, a wood and not like a white box uh, gray scale gray scale environment or something like you know, <coughs> completely untextured. Uh, it's nice to have a bit of control over, you know, we've got, we've got these real-time rendering tools that mean we can render stuff pretty much instantly without any uh, need to uh, pre-render, so you might as well just go the extra mile and uh, <coughs> go the extra mile and add a few little uh, lighting details if you know what you're doing there, which usually impresses the director uh, and gives him an idea of what he can go for. It's also very fast to, of course, change these um, different lighting schemes. So you can see now as I'm moving this light around, I can can uh, do various things with the lights there. Get more spotlight on him or less. So really up to you what you do there. Um, also, there's all these like decals on the ground that you can move around. You know, so I just kind of like you, know, you can go crazy with this stuff. Just uh, duplicate those if you want stuff to blend properly and that kind of stuff. So for a filmmaker, it's once you've used these tools a few times, they're really more like level design tools, but uh, for basically quickly blocking out cin cinematics, it's super fast workflow. Um, and yeah, uh, let's go to the next shot, just see if there's anything interesting there. Uh, yeah, the other thing that's, uh, that can be quite nice, of course, is we've got the depth of field in the engine. 
Um, to preview that, you actually have to hit this uh, button here, track view. And this will show just the track view camera all the time. So whatever track view camera is, is specified in this uh, camera track. So we have two things. We have the director node, which is basically a node that uh, allows you to control which camera uh, is viewed by the editor at one t uh, what time. Uh, and within that director node, you have this track. Uh, track on the track is basically the editing uh, a way of editing between different cameras so you could have like multiple cameras on this track that you can cut to uh, one to the other in a certain order um, so for this for this sequence I have just camera one specified uh, and then uh, I'm actually only using one camera for this entire cinematic just because I don't want to have multiple cameras or something um, all these cameras as well are also uh, the field of view is, is animated between the different cameras and also the depth of field. So if we can see in this camera, I've actually got depth of field turned on. So if I disable that depth of field, you can see in the background all of this stuff becomes unblurry. And then if I want to blur this, I can put it up. If I, I can even pump this up really crazy amounts. In CryEngine 5, we actually have a better depth of field solution than ever before. Uh, so you can see that the edges and the sort of rims around the characters are perfect here. Uh, that's because we've been doing big improvements to the post effects recently. Uh, so there's no ghosting or anything like that. It's very clean looking. Um, hopefully getting closer to uh, having that sort of DreamWorks Pixar rendering quality in real time. That's our goal. Um, animations wise we're not there yet <laughs> for the, with this cinematic. But yeah. Um, so yeah, and this one is, of course, the same thing, uh, same premise as before, just the same exact thing, but I've just added more and more keyframes and animated a bit that he's you know, really kind of like fighting to get up the tree. Uh, you can see here, if I go on the, um, let's see if I can get the, yeah, you can see I've got more stuff going on in the curves here. Um, uh, basically, as he's trying to fight to get up that thing. That's really just a bit of keyframe animation, just a bunch of keyframes, and of course blending between the various animations. Uh, but yeah, all that stuff is, is very fast to put together. It doesn't really take too long. Uh, oh, I also have in this uh, this shot, I think. I think I have at the very end of here some camera shake. Yeah, so that's actually just the camera shake node uh, and all I did was keyframe uh, basically three and, uh, sorry, keyframe, that there's a basic shake that's going on all the time of just point 0.4. So that's really simple, like it's just point, you just double click here on create a new keyframe and then you can just cho choose like point 0.4. Uh, or, you know, if I really want crazy shake here, I can go like, it's shaking all the time basically. Just like insane shake. Um, but yeah, at the very end, I just want when he falls down that there's a bit of ooh, the cameraman just you know drops something or he he's reacting to to the squirrel falling off the tree. So yeah, all that camera shake and stuff is possible as well. Um, let's see what we at number five. Um, yeah, this one actually had a particle effect. I'm not sure if it seems to not work. Right now, let's see if we can maybe get that working. Uh, possibly, I don't have the library installed for this. Uh, we actually ship with uh, the CryEngine game SDK um, a bunch of uh, particle effects, which you can use basically as a bunch of particle effects that you can use uh, to block out the cinematics. And those are things like explosions, smoke, dust, um, uh, muzzle flashes, if you're doing some war, stuff like that. Um, and these are really useful as well. You can take those and you can actually modify those, change those uh, to create different um, uh, different effects of your own. So yeah, super simple, just really easy, <laughs> stupid block out stuff. Of course, you know everything in the end gets uh, will go through lots of polish. Uh, this is just to get an, get an idea of of uh, what the story would be, how that would work. Let's go to the next one, shot number six. 
yeah, and here is, is quite interesting I, to make this little boat. Of course, this is maybe something you'd want to consider actually modeling in the end. Uh, but to make this, I just use actually a bunch of different uh, stick models. <laughs> and I just, pull, I just like push them together. So it's like, just like this. And they're all attached to a tag point. So you can see as I move it, I'm actually just animating this one tag point, uh, which is, is CryEngine's word for a null entity. So if you use After Effects or something like that, you, you just have a null. Tag point is a similar idea. Um, so what I do is I just attach everything via a link system uh, to the null. Um, you can actually see, and if you go into the Level Explorer, uh, this is basically our, um, our version of the outliner from Maya for uh, from Max. And you can see in here, you can actually have a list of all the various uh, objects in the level. And you can actually see, uh, for instance, on my boat, if I open up that tree there, you can see all of the different objects that are attached in the boat. If I click on sync selection. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you can see that these are all just different uh, branches that are just taken from game SDK and just piled up. So yeah, and for the for the uh, staff there, and then for the flag, I've actually used just some grass. <laughs> of course, yeah. a squirrel would have a grass flag. Yeah, how else is he going to make a flag? Um, yeah, and so yeah, this is maybe something you'd want to, of course, model properly in the end. Uh, but for now, it gives the uh, director or uh, whoever you are doing this for, or at least yourself, an idea of what that is. It, and this takes about three minutes to put together, whereas you know modeling it properly could take a you know, few days. Um, so really it's about sort of, this stage is about cutting corners and using shortcuts uh, in order to get stuff done very, very quickly uh, to give people an idea of sort of what's, of what should happen at what point. Uh, the same thing with my squirrel's bow tie here. This is, or I guess, what do you call it? Head tie? I don't know. This girly thing here that she's got on her. I think this used to look a bit better. In hair the, tie. I yeah. think it's a hair tie. This used to look better in, in 3.8 because um, I actually had some primitives that I was using, but now it seems to have just taken the, the default model and colored it pink. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but yeah, you get the idea. It's some sort of like, she looks like a girl because she has pink on her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if yeah. it's sexist. But yeah. I got it the first time you, uh, mm. first time I saw it. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. Made sense. Um, yeah, and then, well, let's see what else we've got here. Yeah, so I've got the tag points. Uh, the color correction stuff I do in the master track, that's really simple. That's just for basically dipping to black. <coughs> uh, so yeah, all of the shots are pretty much using just the same premise or same, same basic uh, theory, it's just adding uh, all of the nodes in there, uh, putting camera into a director node, choosing which camera you want to, to the track view to use, and then having you know maybe two or three <coughs> for different entities in there. So here I've got like this the female squirrel, that's her, the male squirrel, that's him, and then the animations are super basic again, just. They sit there and then she's running off. It's not, it's not uh, rocket science, and it's it doesn't look super amazing or something, but it gets the story across, and that's really the point of of block Right, out. you understand it. That's so, what. Yeah, exactly. There's no reason to to polish crazily at this stage, and it means that if somebody does come along and they want to basically add things and really change stuff integrally, you can do it. Uh, you know, you can even do that on a lighting level as well. Like if somebody comes to you and says like, now I want to have complete different atmosphere or lighting, uh, you can, you know, quickly go into the um, uh, environment editor and just go like, okay, well, what if it's not orange? What if it's nighttime looking? What if it's, you know, super dark kind of, uh, kind of thing instead? Uh, and then you can, you know, play around with all the different lights and figure out how to make it look like a nighttime scene. So usually this stuff is very is very fast turnaround. Um, 
see if I can't. Oh, I have total elimination on that's fine. Total elimination is also awesome. Gives you a nice. Um, can get you very nice results very quickly. So yeah, now it's more like nighttime, a darker scene. And yeah. So of course it's very, very easy just to come up with different, uh, different stories, different uh, blockouts of the same thing. Um, you can also see in this sequence I'm also adhering a lot to the, the half circle. Like I never go past this line uh, across the, the scene here. So if I go up to the top of the scene, you can see the line is actually across here. Uh. Yeah, so it's actually across the center of the river. Uh, and so that's like what I was saying before about uh, the line of action is that if I would basically go and look at the scene from this way, that I'm breaking my line of action because then he's on the right and she's on the left. So if I keep to my line of action, he's always on the left, she's always on the right. And we always get this idea of where the river is. The river's on our right. You know, when we get across here, the river's on our left. Right. Not that you would have this weird situation where it's like you cross the river, but then you suddenly have the camera on the other side, and then it feels like we're still over there when we're actually over here. You know what I mean? That it's very, it, it becomes this very sort of like confusing thing if you're always switching around the cinematography. Uh, people don't always necessarily notice that the light direction is the, is, has changed or is, is still the same, something like that. Um, so it really needs to, you really need to keep to that half circle rule if you want people to understand. And the only times you should really ever break that rule is if you're trying to do something very meaningful or fancy in some way. Uh, but that's usually a more advanced thing. Uh, so don't try doing that unless you're Stanley Kubrick or um, <laughs> Spielberg, maybe somebody like that, you know, who really knows what he's doing and knows when to sort of make people um, make people sort of lose track or believe it. Yeah, like if it, it's like if you want people to lose track. <laughs> That, or, or get disoriented, sure. then of course you can try this. Achieved with CryEngine.